I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the award-winning PRS Journal Club podcast with your hosts, Drs. Francesco Agro, Nikki Phillips, and Ira Savetsky. Enjoy. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the January 2018 edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast. This is the first podcast of 2018, and we are a new team of resident ambassadors. I'm Ira Savetsky, PRS resident ambassador from NYU, and I'm joined by my co-resident ambassadors, Francesco Agro from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and Nikki Phillips from the Harvard Plastic Surgery Program. I want to thank the incredible resident ambassadors from last year, Jordan Fry, Chad Purnell, and Shuja Shafgat. You have set the bar extremely high. Thank you so much for an outstanding year. Today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Bernard Lee, Professor of Surgery at Harvard Medical School, Chief of the Division of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery at Beth Israel Deaconese Medical Center, and co-director of the Peter J. Sharp Program for Aesthetic and Reconstructive Breast Surgery at Beth Israel Deaconese Medical Center. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for joining us for this PRS Journal Club podcast. The article we'll be discussing is Staying Safe During Gluteal Fat Transplantation by authors Dr. Villanova, Davecchio, and Afruz, Jordan Karobi, and Dr. Rod Roark. A quick reminder, all of the articles that we will discuss can be read for free on prsjournal.com, including an archive of all past Journal Club articles. To begin, gluteal augmentation with fat grafting, also known as a Brazilian butt lift, is becoming more and more popular. We saw an approximately 25% increase in 2016 compared to the year before. Unfortunately, a number of fatalities have been reported. A task force formed by the Aesthetic Surgery Education and Research Foundation to evaluate the incidence of fat embolism, both fatal and non-fatal. Approximately 1 in 6,000 fatal and 1 in 1,900 non-fatal fat pulmonary emboli were associated with gluteal fat grafting. There are various fat injection techniques, subcutaneous, intramuscular, or both. These fatalities are thought to be a result of either direct injection into a large gluteal vein or injury to a gluteal vein with subsequent inflow of fat lobules from the surrounding tissues. The goal of this paper was to review the key anatomy and delineate the most important concepts in order to improve patient safety during buttock augmentation with back grafting. In terms of patient selection, it's important to screen patients for their risk of bleeding, any history of DVT and or PE. Also want to examine the lower extremities for large varicosities and assess sciatic nerve symptoms. It's important to have a baseline sciatic nerve exam as this may be injured during gluteal augmentation, but also it has been suggested that patients with sciatic nerve symptoms may have varicose veins in the region of the sciatic nerve distribution. In terms of anatomy, there are two main groups of muscles in the gluteal region, which are commonly grouped as superficial, which are the larger muscles, such as the gluteus maximus and minimus, and deep, which are the smaller muscles, such as the piriformis and obturator internus. The vascular supply to this region is the superior and inferior gluteal arteries, and the sciatic nerve is found in the plane between the superficial and deep group of gluteal muscles. In terms of markings, in addition to preoperative markings for identification of areas of liposuction and lipofilling, it's important to identify the danger triangles of each buttock. The apex of the triangles is the posterior superior iliac spines, the inferior lateral point is located at the greater trochanter, and the inferior medial point is at the ischial tuberosity. The area within these triangles identifies the regions of the major gluteal vessels in the sciatic nerve. In terms of fat harvest and preparation, there are various techniques, and as a whole, there isn't any overwhelming evidence to suggest one method is superior to another. The authors do a nice job going through their preferred technique. In terms of positioning, following positioning for lipos aspiration, the authors advocate placing the patient in a prone position with hip flex and a jackknife position. They believe this position allows cannula injection in more of a subcutaneous and superficial muscular plane. There are four key principles which the authors discuss, which they believe are critical to remaining safe during gluteal fat grafting portion of the procedure. Number one, use of a large bore blunt cannula. This can minimize the risk of venous injury and can potentially make penetration into the deeper musculature more difficult. Also, large bore cannulas have been demonstrated to improve adipocyte viability. Number two, use of continual motion can prevent direct and continuous injection into a vessel. Also, with continual motion, the graft is dispersed throughout the tissue planes, allowing for greater likelihood of adequate libular diffusion and improved graft take. Number three, remain primarily in the subcutaneous tissue, which is the author's preference, or superficial muscle, and only in the subcutaneous plane in the triangle of danger. Knowing the exact planar position of the cannula tip 100% of the time with every stroke of the cannula is what the authors believe to be the most important variable to staying safe. 
The most dangerous part of this procedure is inadvertent injection into the deep medial gluteal region. Remaining in the subcutaneous plane within the bounds of the triangles of danger will significantly decrease the risk of inadvertent vascular injury or direct vascular injection. Number four, do not fill to excessively high recipient site pressures. Theoretically, the risk with excessive pressures in the setting of a possible venous injury can lead to pressure gradients in which favors fat entrance into lower pressure vein lumen. Overfilling at increased pressure also reduces oxygen diffusion capabilities, which decreases the amount of graft survival. In terms of postoperative care, compressive garments and standard postoperative DVT prophylaxis and early ambulation. Although there's no consensus in the literature, keeping pressure off of the graft excises is typically recommended for a minimum of two weeks postoperatively. I think that overall, this was uh, an excellent and very important article. Given the increasing popularity of these procedures, patients will be coming to our aesthetic clinics and as well as our offices and will be requesting to have this procedure done. I think it's critical to understand the anatomy, select good patients, and have a thorough understanding of the safe and proper surgical technique to minimize any catastrophic complications. Dr. Lee, what are your thoughts about this paper, and what are some of your clinical pearls when performing this type of procedure? This is a very important paper when it comes to fat grafting in that Gluteal fat grafting is becoming increasingly popular. This Brazilian butt lift that you mentioned, patients are coming in more and more nowadays for gluteal augmentation. When we think about fat grafting to the gluteal area, the key is safety and making sure that our fat grafts are not causing potential injury in terms of fat embolism. The reality is as a perforator flap surgeon, I personally am very familiar with the superior and inferior gluteal vessel anatomy as we dissect perforator flaps in these locations all the time. I would uh, caution that prior to proceeding with this, having a thorough understanding of the anatomy of the vascular supply to the superior and inferior gluteal region would be extremely important in order to avoid direct injection of the fat into these vessels. One potential tip that I would have is that uh, an intraoperative ultrasound could probably identify the location of these vessels and maybe even assist with placement of the fat grafts in the proper locations. I do agree with the authors that uh, the question is whether or not these fat emboli occur because of direct injection into the vessels or whether or not there could be an injury to the vessels and the increased pressure of the fat injected may preferentially diffuse the fat into the vessel, and that that may be a real concern. So the real question is how much to uh, graft, at what pressure, and how much fat will take in these different locations. So at the end of the day, looking at this paper, looking at the safe zones that the, the authors describe, and looking at the different keys to safety are all extremely important with this type of surgery. Those are some really great points. Using an intraoperative ultrasound is something that I haven't really thought of, but that definitely seems like a good tip. Francesco, what do you think about this paper? I thought this paper provides a very thorough review of what I think is a very timely topic and uh, which is of great significance not only to patients, but surgeons and societies. More literature is coming out about the safety of gluteal fat transplantation. And to highlight its importance, in fact, a task force, as the authors mentioned, was set up to explore safety concerns of this procedure. And at ASPS, this topic was highly discussed. I thoroughly enjoyed this article because it clearly laid out how to approach a patient interested in gluteal fat transplantation. And just like you said, you know, these patients come to our residence clinic and it's good to have kind of a checklist of things that we should consider beforehand during surgery and postoperatively. And the authors do a great job discussing this with the patient selection, relevant anatomy and surgical technique. And not only this article was uh, full of pearls from leaders in the field, but it also summarized the literature beautifully, making it a very comprehensive review of the topic. I thought it was very interesting to see how there has been a shift. A couple of decades ago, there were recommendations from papers from South America where they were recommended to inject intramuscularly because of the increased fat grafting survival. But then obviously because of a new paper demonstrated that, that there was an increase in mortality associated with it. And a major fear of uh, gluteal fat grafting, from my perspective, is uh, really fat embolism. And so to Dr. Lee, what would you recommend? Uh, how should we act when we suspect fat embolisms? And if you have any other pearls to reduce this, and you suggested ultrasound, is that something that you could potentially suggest to do routinely? 
I think the key is making sure that you understand the anatomy and understanding where the danger zones would be in terms of injection. Whether or not using intraoperative ultrasound is almost extraneous, but may be beneficial. But the key is actually making sure that the fat injections are not concentrated in areas where the superior gluteal and inferior gluteal vessels are located. I think there's a lot of controversy in terms of where the fat grafts should be placed. Should they be placed in the subcutaneous plane? Should they be placed in the muscle? And I don't have a strong opinion about that, but the reality is that as long as those fat grafts are not placed adjacent or too close to the vessels, that's probably the most important take-home point from this paper. As for what happens in terms of fat embolism, it depends on your setting in terms of where you're doing this type of surgery, whether this is in outpatient surgery, where the patient's intubated, or whether or not this is done under local anesthesia, the finding of a fat embolism can be very different in all these different scenarios. I think, you know, one of the key things to fat embolism is if patients intubate and that there are problems with O2 saturation and things like that, that this is very important to discuss and have an open line of communication with your anesthesiologist so that a suspicion of fat embolism could be very high with this type of procedure. Thanks, Dr. Lee. No, absolutely. It's certainly a big concern uh, for everyone, especially when you see these statistics of, you know, relatively speaking, high mortality for uh, a cosmetic procedure like fat grafting. Thank you very much. I think you're right. That's very important. If you think about this, you know, the authors here are talking about a 1 in 6,000 rate of mortality that may range all the way down to 1 in 1,900. That's pretty high for, in terms of the types of procedures that we do. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What about you, Nikki? What were your thoughts of the paper? You know, I agree with everything that's been said so far. I think this is a really timely topic. I certainly heard a lot of people talking about it, as you mentioned, at some of the national meetings. And within our own institutions, it's been hotly debated and talked about and thought about. And so one of the things that's been on my mind when we're thinking about proceeding with this, you know, if we have the safety pearls in place, we know the anatomy. I still think a question of Patient education and patient consent is very important. And so, Dr. Lee, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on properly educating patients about the risks associated with this procedure and how we can ensure that the people understand what they're getting into when they sign up for the Brazilian butt lift. The preoperative consultation with the patient, the discussion in terms of the patient expectations, the risks and benefits, and most importantly, the data that we currently have about fat embolism should all be discussed with the patient extensively preoperatively. Although we're very experienced at talking about the risks and benefits of relatively minor procedures, when you get to something like this where the mortality rate can be high in certain hands, it becomes a very difficult conversation to have with patients preoperatively. I think the other piece is discussing the patient expectations and maybe some of the issues that we're seeing is that with gluteal fat grafting, this often requires a large volume of fat and maybe the more prudent course would be for staged fat grafting at smaller volumes to reduce the potential risks for things like fat embolism. So I think this is a very important piece of decision-making that you have to have with the patient and the preoperative consultation and discussion has to really cover all these major points for this type of surgery. Dr. Lee, you mentioned this could be done certainly under general anesthesia. There are some people doing it under local anesthesia, hospital-based, office-based. There are some plastic surgeons advocating performing this under local anesthesia. And the thought is that patients that are awake or somewhat awake may verbalize increased pain if injection is occurring in a more deeper, more dangerous plane. Do you think there is some value with that? I personally like my patients under anesthesia. It's very difficult to have fine control of the surgery under local anesthesia, especially with long surgery. And so when we start talking about processing large volumes of fat and having patients under local anesthesia for a long period of time, I find it difficult to control where the fat is going and the circumstances of the actual surgery itself. So in my hands, I feel that it's better to have patients under general anesthesia. That being said, whether or not it's safe to do this under local anesthesia, I suppose depends on how much fat you're injecting. And maybe there is some truth to having a discussion with the patient while this is happening so that you can understand whether or not they're having pain and things like that. You can change in terms of the depths of the injections 
and maybe that would be more beneficial to patient outcomes. Hard for me to say. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for a great discussion. I think with that, we'll end our discussion of this article. Remember to tune in to the other two articles that we'll be discussing on this month's podcast, as well as the PRS Journal Club podcast that will be broadcast every month. Also, please join us this month for the debut of PRS Journal Club on Facebook, where we will be able to interact directly with this month's selected articles authors. And once again, thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for joining us. Thank you for having me. 